Good evening, all. Good evening, Good evening. Good evening all. Women to Women, once again, welcome you all. We've got Dr. We've got Dr. Graham Munro Hall with Lillian, his partner, who's done a tremendous work on this vitamin C. We're going to start off with a little prayer and then I'm going to hand over to Dr. Graham. And also, after he's half an hour talk on vitamin C and infections, we've got QNS which I would like you guys to put all your questions in the chat. We've got three la beautiful ladies reading out the questions and Dr. Monroe will actually answer them for you. And if we haven't got time, enough time to cover all the questions, we will definitely answer them in due course. I'm gonna start off the little prayers, which we normally do. Oh. Oh, oh, Om oh, 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 Dio yona prachote yat ambur bua swaha tat savitur varenyam Rukho deva shyati mai Dio yona prachote yat ambur bua swaha tat Dio yo na prachutaya, Dio yo na prachutaya, Dio yo na prachutaya. Thank you very much again. We've got Davina in the questionnaire to read out, and then we've got I don't know if you heard me, but my uh, iPad just knocked me off. So we've got, um, as I'm saying, Davina in the questionnaire, and we've got Minu and Gita in the questionnaire. So please do put your questions in the chat, and the ladies kindly will note it down and ask Dr. Graham. Can I invite Dr. Graham to start off with his um, slides? Anna Ben, can we leave the questions until after um, Dr. Graham has um, done his presentation? People should put the yeah, questions in. Yeah, say. yeah, after after he does his presentation. No, no. Yeah, after after the presentation. Yeah. The Q and A's. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Graham. All yours. Okay. Thank you. Can you hear me out there? It's good. Yeah. Happy? Thanks. Oh, okay. Very good. Well, uh, thank you very much for the invitation. Tonight's uh, presentation I've called Vitamin C and Infections. There's going to be a lot of information here come out in, in, in the next half an hour. It's going to be a very short time. This is usually a talk I, I give to doctors and dentists, which lasts between uh, one and two hours, but I'm giving it to you in a full, all full technical uh, details in half an hour, because I expect a lot of you and being housewives, doctors and dentists, when we talk to them, aren't really listening. So what we're going to talk today about is the how, when and why you should use vitamin C. And I'm going to relate it especially to COVID-19, but also to, to other conditions. Now, to start with, this is just a, a disclaimer, because I don't know any of you personally. I am providing information to do your own research and refer to your health professional for advice. Do not take anything I say as medical advice. The aim of this talk is to help you protect yourself and your loved ones from illness. 
I would advise to you to get a, a note pan, a note pad and pen ready because there's an awful lot of information coming in a short time. I'll provide a link to download the whole of this presentation if you email me and I can send you the link and then you can get this presentation uh, to you. And you can also, if there's any questions that you feel haven't been answered at the end of this session, you're free, please feel free to email me. The email is at the bottom of the slide. If you see it, it says Dr. G, Dr. L at protonmail.com. Okay, so an introduction. Uh, Lillian and I were both re retired dentists. Uh, now, uh, I, I've been a dentist, or I first graduated 50 years ago. We started a, a metal-free holistic dental practice in Bedford in uh, the year 2000. And before that, we worked in, in, uh, in general practice, general dental practice in Germany. The reason we started this metal-free holistic practice was because of our own personal experience and seeing so many people who became ill after dental treatment, and we realized we could actually bring them back. I'm the chief officer now in retirement of uh, the chief dental officer for the World Alliance for Mercury Free Dentistry. This is a, an NGO based in, in Washington. And what we did, we are negotiating at the Minamata Convention, and we are the ones instrumental in persuading the EU to ban mercury now uh, for women and children, you know, part, part of the pressure group. Uh, that's really been a lifetime. My lifetime goal is to stop the use of mercury in, in dentistry. We started to use intravenous vitamin C after a whole serendipity of circumstances brought us into it. And then we pioneered the use of, of glutathione. And this is over 30 years ago. We've used vitamin C especially intravenous vitamin C, which is where you inject it, which is called IVC now, as I say, for over 30 years. We've written a book, which is here, Toxic Dentistry Exposed, which is a link between dentistry and disease. We created a therapy which we call the VTOX therapy. This is to treat what we call in the book MCDs, which is modern chronic diseases. By a modern chronic disease, we mean things like Parkinson's, multiple sclerosis, Alzheimer's, multiple chemical sensitivity, chronic fatigue syndrome. All these are what we call the new diseases. Things like Alzheimer's was only described in uh, 1908. MS was virtually unknown before the uh, 1850s and, and, and so on. As I say, contact us with emails or questions afterwards. And to show how we got into this, I'll just share my own story about vitamin C. When I was 28 years of age, uh, I went to a conference and had uh, a free medical. And the cardiologist at this medical said that I should go home and see a specialist urgently. So the conference was in California. So when I got back into the UK, I did so. And what they told me was that at the age of 28, I had about five years left to live because I had a horizontal, um, the horizontal axis of the heart was gone and there was uh, cholesterol was off the roof and I had chronically high blood pressure and literally uh, had given five to 10 years max to live. And by sheer chance, I found out that if I took 20 grams of C, of vitamin C, 20 grams a day, the symptoms disappeared. And that put me on the journey then of the, the, between vitamin C and mercury and heart disease and how it became for me literally a, a lifesaver. Just to show uh, who I am, on the, on the right is a picture of me. This is at uh, a United Nations Environment Programme meeting. This particular one was in Tokyo. We go around as our NGO, uh, now they call it the Minimata Convention, and we give our import and our... Uh, our advice, expertise, etc., to to the um, uh, UN, and get them to try to obviously follow our, our point of view. And we're obviously fighting against industry and the uh, uh, and the dentists uh, generally. And that just on on the left side is a picture of me and in, the, in the, one of the stupid things I used to do, which was racing motorcycles and things. As I say, racing a motorcycle in a happily misspent youth. 
I don't do that anymore. That's the bike that nearly killed me, by the way. This is the book that we've got. It's called Toxic Dentistry Exposed. It's a link between dentistry and chronic disease. And these are the diseases we've put out here to name, uh, to name a few. You can get it on Amazon and you can get it uh, on, on Kindle. It's an easy to read book. It was written for patients and it's very easy to follow. A review of the book was done by Sandra Goodman, uh, uh, well, Dr. Sandra Goodman, editor of the Health Magazine, and she called it, and I always like this review, a highly subversive, specialist, informative, and quite possibly life-saving book, which is exactly what we set out to be. Now then, if we go back into a little bit into history, the, there's been pioneers of vitamin C uh, treatment. It's not new. You've all heard, of course, of uh, Linus Pauling, who in, a, in the uh, 70s, 80s and 90s was pushing uh, vitamin C. But the first one on the scene was Dr. Frederick Klenner, who was a doctor in, in the Southern United States. And he came out with the saying, there's no condition vitamin C cannot help if given for long enough and in high enough doses. And that is a key saying, there is no condition that vitamin C cannot help if given for long enough and in high enough doses. Now he treated and wrote about conditions for anything from snake bite uh, to uh, drug overdose with vitamin C. In fact, in the early 1950s, they used vitamin C was the treatment of choice uh, for drug overdoses, and it's extremely effective. Robert Cathcart was an orthopedic surgeon in California, and he's the one who wrote about the rapid healing, and he brought bowel tolerance, which we'll talk about, to the fore. Dr. Erwin Stone has also uh, written a book, all these three are long dead, I'm afraid, uh, but then the excellent background. Other useful books you can get is Dr. Sandra Goodman has written books on vitamin C, especially in relation to cancer. So has Professor uh, Linus Pauling and Ewan Cameron in, in relation to, can, to uh, cancer. Uh, Steve Hickey has written a good book on the whole background of vitamin C. And the most up-to-date one is Dr. Thomas Levy. Uh, Dr. Levy is a cardiologist in America and he's written uh, several books about uh, vitamin C and how it can help you, especially in relation to infections and especially in relation uh, to his own speciality heart disease. Underneath the picture of Linus there, you will see four websites. These, the first one is a website I created at the beginning of this so-called pandemic, which shows how intravenous vitamin C could stop COVID in its tracks. And we give all the scientific links and the reasonings, and I'll show you how we approach government and what, they, what their response was later on. And the other one's an information site, which you can go down and, and find all the relative information about any condition vitamin C has been known to treat over the years. If you don't get all that down, down now, as I say, just email me afterwards and then you can have this whole presentation sent to you. Basically, the benefits of vitamin C are, are, are very basic. Shall we say it supports immune health. Without it, your immune system just does not work. And we'll go into this in a little bit. It improves health and uh, adrenal health generally overall and skin, joints, because of its collagen. It is vital uh, for collagen uh, production and is a very good uh, uh, use in, um, in, in cosmetics in, in uh, improving wrinkles, etc. It improves blood flow and heart health, which I'll go into uh, in detail. It's a good anti-aging uh, device and it improves a histamine response, which really is an anti-inflammatory. It reduces inflammation because it's coming more and more to the fore now that most diseases that people suffer from are in fact diseases of inflammation. Now, if we go over types of vitamin C, you can see its chemical formula there. Now, I don't know if you can see the little cursor I've got here, but the keys to vitamin C success are these two groups at the bottom. These two groups at the bottom are what we call electron donors, and that is the key. It's an electron donor. I'll come on to the technical bit in a minute. Other types of vitamin C you can get orally and easily available everywhere, no prescription, it's ascorbic acid. Ascorbic acid is the vitamin C. It is an acid. 
You can get it in a white powder. It's water soluble. Vitamin C is a water soluble uh, uh, vitamin. Some people don't uh, like this too much because of a slight sour taste and it can cause stomach upsets. Ester C is a new kid on the block. That's really calcium ascorbate with some of the uh, metabolites of vitamin C. That was created in order to make vitamin C more palatable and so you could uh, swallow it without getting the, uh, uh, the, st the stomach up upset. There's a lot of claiming about vitamin C, uh, ester C to say that it lasts longer in the blood, but there's no real uh, proof of that. Liposomal is the latest one on, on the block, which we'll talk about uh, in depth in a few slides further on. And liposomal is a way of taking C orally, which can get you very high levels of vitamin C uh, in the blood. Underneath there, the sodium, calcium, magnesium, all these are ascorbate. Ascorbate is really the part of the vitamin C molecule here. So you can get magnesium attached to it or calcium or sodium. Again, these are used if people are unable to tolerate the vitamin C itself. And gram for gram, they are about 80% effect, as effective as vitamin C. In other words, you need to take more of the ascorbate, sodium, calcium, or magnesium than you would do pure vitamin C. <clears throat> if we come onto the intravenous, that's sodium ascorbate. Because it's acidic, you can't just inject it into the blood. Again, I'll go over in a bit more detail about intravenous, but intravenous, when we say intravenous vitamin C, what we're really talking about is intravenous sodium ascorbate, which is buffered to create the same pH or acidity as the blood. Now then, Lifestyle choices, vitamin C, to maintain high levels, you've got to do really these five things. You have to avoid sugar. Glucose and sugar are very close in chemical composition to vitamin C, and they compete with vitamin C for absorption. And I'm afraid glucose usually wins. So you really have to avoid sugar. You have to use vitamin C supplements, which I'll come on to, and I'll show you why vitamin C C supplementation is absolutely essential for your health, maintaining health, as well as recovering health from illness. And then vitamin C rich food, which is um, uh, sort of understandable. Intermittent fasting is another technique which we haven't got time to go into. And then boosting glutathione. And glutathione, again, is one of the keys to this. Diet and lifestyle are critical for health. You cannot just take a pill and get on with it. We have, we're going to talk about things, how much, say, smoking takes vitamin C uh, from the blood and diet. So supplements are essential for health. The reason we need it is that as why most animals can make their own vitamin C, we can't make vitamin C. We have to take it from our diet. It's the same, not just for us, say, guinea pigs, certain types of fruit bat do it. There's a two, I think there's two forms of uh, bird. The big apes do it, a gorilla. Uh, takes on average through its diet eight grams of vitamin C uh, a day. But we unfortunately have lost that capability, so we need to, to take the vitamin C in. Now, the reason for this is this. Can you get enough vitamin C from food? And the resounding answer is no, it's impossible anymore. There was a time when you possibly could. But let's look at these three tables. They're from a book called McCants and Widow's Son. And every 10 years, they bring this book out and there's new tables brought in. This is from a lecture that I gave many, many years ago, because I spend my life talking to um, uh, any, anyone who listens to me about this effect. But if you go to table one, when they measured these different minerals, sodium, potassium, magnesium, calcium, iron, copper and zinc, in the same fields, and they, they were growing the vegetables in the same fields to make it same, these are the reductions that they've got. So between 39 and 91, there's been a drop in all these basic minerals. And if we go then to fruit, you can see the same sort of things between then and 1991. Now, the situation since then has, in fact, gotten dramatically worse. And one of the reasons it's got worse is this uh, depletion of the topsoil. In North America, they only have 25% of the topsoil left now than they had when the settlers first came in and started farming. 
And we in Europe are only a little bit further behind, and in Asia, they're a little bit further behind. I think in Asia now it's about sort of 40% uh, uh, left. So there has been massive degradation of the soil, not just in the mineral content, which is very low. Any vegetables grown in the UK will virtually have no selenium in because we're very selenium deficient in the soil here. So the quantity of topsoil is going down and the quality of the soil is going down. Now, what we've said here under one and two, under table one, are these are the existential actual threats to the human race. Compared to global warming, global warming is nothing compared to what we're going to face in the fairly near future with topsoil degradation and the reduction of the insect pollinators, which are needed to produce the food. So the only purpose of this slide is to say that if someone says, I have a healthy diet, they may have a healthy diet, but the quality of the food, even organic food now, is not enough to supply you with the minerals and vitamins you need to stay healthy, especially in the toxic world we face, when dentists are putting poisons into you, doctors are putting poisons into you, and you're breathing and suffering from the pollutants of everyday life. So up what is our optimal vitamin C intake? Well, I'm going to divide this into three sections. The first one is deficiency. The RDA, which is the recommended dental, uh, recommended, sorry, daily allowance, I'm too much thinking of teeth here, is 90 milligrams for men and 75 milligrams uh, for women. We would say the actual RDA should be a minimum of 250 milligrams to one gram daily. And that is actually just to prevent deficiency because the effects of, of low vitamin C on the body, I think the, the one that everyone thinks to is scurvy, the one that the sailors used to die of in their hundreds of thousands in, in the uh, years ago. It has a reduced, uh, gives you a reduced resistance to infectious diseases, both viral and bacterial. And the good thing about vitamin C, I want you to remember is, not only does it kill bacteria, it's a safe and effective way of killing viruses. And that's something that has been known for nearly 70 years. Without a, a high vitamin C content, you have a lower threshold to toxins, especially things like mercury and lead, which can lead you to neurological problems and then give you rise to things like multiple sclerosis and, and Parkinson's. But worst of all, it creates a disease of the inflammation, diseases of inflammation, uh, which are in fact things like Parkinson's, MS are all inflammatory diseases now and heart attacks too. The optimal C intake for health and high resistance to disease. This is what we say you should take between three and 10 grams a day. I personally, when I was working as a dentist, took on average between 13 and 20 grams a day. And I've been doing this since I first got into this. Well, I'm in my 70s now and I started at the age of 28. So you can see how long that's been going. And this is to use as a preventive against illness. Uh, we'll, I'll read a little bit out of the book uh, to talk about bowel tolerance in a minute, but let's talk about the heart attacks. Why don't goats get heart attacks? An average goat produces between 13 and 15 grams a day in their body. Goats are very hardy creatures. They never get ill, 13 to 15 grams. A rat, a small rat will produce between two and three grams a day. A small dog will produce between five and seven, and a bigger dog up to 12 grams of vitamin C a day. It's so effective against heart attacks that Linus Pauling in 1994 patented this, as he gave a US patent office, and there's the number, 5278189. This was a patent office. Now to patent something, you have to prove that it works, and he proved that it works, vitamin C against heart disease, but it became an open patent, anyone can use it. And Mr. David Leake, who was a heart sufferer himself, wrote this book, a patented, heart, a patented Heart Disease Cure That Works. And so if any of your, yourself, friends and family are suffering from heart problem, I would really recommend that you get that book. When we lead to the tolerance of vitamin C, what I'm going to say is, is this. I'm just going to read a few paragraphs out of the book because it says it very nicely. Vitamin C given orally can cause looseness of the bowels. This is called bowel tolerance and will vary from individual and the degree of ill health of that individual. For instance, the author, that's me, came back from holiday from Sri Lanka. 
There he had made friends with Michael, the hotel's python. However, on the flight back, the author came down with a severe fever of rapid onset, probably caught from the python. He was a very friendly python. We used to sit together. He used to wind himself around me in the evening. Back home, he took 120 grams of sea over 24 hours. So every two hours, I was spooning sea down myself until I got this, what we call, bowel tolerance. The next 24 hours, the bowel tolerance was reduced to 70 grams. 24 hours later, it was down to 30 grams, and the fever and the illness had completely dissipated. The progress to, on, the, on the path back to health could be measured by the amount of vitamin C taken. The more ill the patient is, the more vitamin C is required before bowel tolerance was, was reached. This is an uncomfortable way of taking C, but it's very effective for all that. Beware vitamin C destroyers. Smoking, every cigarette smoke destroys 50 milligrams of vitamin C. So someone who smokes 10 a day is using up 500 milligrams of the vitamin C in their body. It's really the vitamin C is, used, is being used up to prevent the toxic effects of the cigarette smoke. Stress, whether it's mental or physical stress, puts you into a fight and flight syndrome, it gives your adrenals a rush, and in order for the adrenals to function, they need vitamin C, and vitamin C will be used up. Sugar, as we've said before, sugar in any of its forms, be it, uh, even, even fruit sugar, uh, uh, fructose, glucose, sucrose, all of these sugars will destroy vitamin C in the body. Oxidative stress, this is a good one. By oxidative stress, which we'll come on to in a little bit. These are uh, things like the drugs. Every drug given to you, prescribed to you, or over-the-counter drug is there uh, to inhibit a system of your body. It's there to act as a block, and it has to be detoxified by the liver. That detoxification requires vitamin C to do it. So every time you take a medication, you're going to increase your need for vitamin C. The chemicals we have in everyday life, things like these air fresheners that are plugged into a wall that release chemicals, you breathe in these chemicals, they will cause oxidative stress in the body, and that itself can lead to disease, so you need the vitamin C to combat this. Infections, when infections attack uh, uh, the body and, and go into cells, the, in order to combat them, certain the immune system has to be on alert, it has to be alerted, it has to create the right cells. In order to attack these infections, it can only do so if there's sufficient vitamin C. If it uses up the vitamin C in the body stores, then the immune system stalls. Ozone's another one. Ozone therapy is very popular, but it is an oxidant and it will destroy the, uh, the, uh, the vitamin C. Ozone itself is a useful, um, a, a useful therapy, and you can use ozone in conjunction with, uh, with vitamin C because ozone itself can destroy bacteria and viruses, but there's a way of using it with vitamin C so it doesn't use the vitamin C out of the body. Um, I'm not going to go into that today. Alcohol itself reduces uh, the level uh, of antioxidants because that's an oxidative stressor. However, there are other benefits to moderate alcohol consumption and I'm gonna to stick to that story and no one's gonna make me change it. The third thing is to treat overt symptoms of disease. And here we're talking about using vitamin C, in fact, as a medicine or as a drug, not as, as a vitamin. Here you have the therapeutic threshold dose. In other words, it's not like a little bit is good and, and more of it is better. You need to take enough to get over that threshold to treat the disease. So it's no use saying, well, I've got a cold, I've got COVID, I've got whatever, I'll just take a couple of grams. That may not be anywhere near enough to have the effect. You have got to get over that therapeutic threshold dose. This is really what we call orthomolecular medicine. In order to get these very high blood levels of vitamin C, you can only do it. You can only do it intravenously or with liposomal. I prefer, and we have preferred over the years intravenous because it's uh, very quick, uh, very effective. And rather than just use liposomal on its own, because intravenous, in fact, can get you higher levels than liposomal, but liposomal is good, especially when they're used together uh, with intravenous. Obviously, at home, intravenous vitamin C is not possible, but there you can and probably should use liposomal. 
together, we, we use fit liposomal and oral C, but we're never ill. We haven't visited the doctor in years, um, possibly because of our lifestyle, but mainly because, of, well, I think, the, the sheer amount of vitamin C we're taking. Intravenously, you can give up to 250 grams of vitamin C a day possible. I know this because we actually, it's described in the book, we actually did this to a Gulf War veteran who came back uh, from that conflict with the usual Gulf War syndromes and couldn't be treated with anything. And we gave him 250 grams a day for three days intravenously and his symptoms disappeared. And to put that in context, that would be 250,000 milligrams or over two and a half thousand times the recommended daily allowance of vitamin C. For him, that was a therapeutic threshold dose to get over uh, Gulf War syndrome. Now, suggested um, suppliers that we use, trusted sources. Now, the most trusted source that I know for liposomal C, vitamin C, is this website I've put up here, vitalorganico.ie. This particular um, uh, site, which was uh, uh, opened up by a patient of ours, I have to say, by recommending this, we have no links or advantages, financial or otherwise, with these. I'm just happy to mention this as a source of supplier that, that we use, entirely independent. They do liposomal vitamin C, liposomal glutathione, liposomal vitamin D, and K2, as well as all the, all, all the other powders. Other reliable companies are healthleads.co.uk, uh, which are, again, a good reliable company. I mean, you can get other, others out there. Now then, to go back to this, a patient who, uh, who started this uh, uh, company, uh, she was a patient of ours and she experienced vitamin C firsthand and, and she wanted to go uh, the liposomal route. But liposomal at that time was A, fairly new and B, extremely expensive, and mainly done to multi-level marketing things, very, very expensive. So she created an inexpensive liposomal uh, product and not only did that, she used organic vitamin C to make it. And she also used, uh, she didn't use a soy lecithin, which is uh, normally used, she uses organic sunflower oil. So just to say that her vital C is a liposomal delivery system optimizing the bioavailability of vitamin C. What really happens is the vitamin C is wrapped around what they call phospholipids, which is the same thing as you find on cells. These cells, uh, the phospholipids attach themselves to the phospholipids in a cell and they push the vitamin C through into it. A particular one is from uh, tapioca. And then say vitamin C is an antioxidant playing a critical role in the immune system, joints and artery health and letting things to start function properly. Vitamin C is extremely difficult to absorb in high doses as it's water soluble and your body cannot store adequate amounts of it. So liposomal is a good way to go. As I say, there, are, there is a problem with liposomal, which I'll come to now. They were discovered by a Dr. Alec Banham in Cambridge University for lipo, which is uh, Greek for fat, and it means a little fat layer around the uh, molecules of vitamin C. And it was, what do you make these liposomes from? The liposomes traditionally made and made by all the commercial manufacturers out there use soy lecithin to make liposomes. The problem with soy lecithin is it's a phytoestrogen. It acts as an estrogen. This causes problems, especially, and I put in females of a certain age. They're, they're very, very sensitive to these phytoestrogens. So if you use organic sunflower lecithin, that's a much safer option and you don't get any of the problems that you do get with the soy lecithin. And this is why we, uh, we would recommend Vital Organico as a safe and reliable and inexpensive source of this. How does it work? Well, I hope you've all got your brains together here because this is where you're going to need them. Let's... Okay, the basic thing about vitamin C, it is oxidation reduction reaction. It's not a chelation. It does not 
take metals out of your body like mercury and lead, not things like um, DMPS, DMSA or EDTA, which are the most commonly used ones in, in, in practice out there. It's an electron donator. It donates electrons. So you need to get your brains at the ready here because if you can see the cursor here, you have ascorbic acid here. And then this is a hydrogen atoms. And these hydrogen atoms, spare hydrogen atoms, have spare electrons. They donate these electrons to the free radicals caught in the problem. When they donate an electron, they become into this form, an ascorbate free radical. And then it can go eventually to dehydroascorbate. De when it becomes dehydroascorbate, then that means the vitamin C is in fact used up. However, there's a way to uh, keep regenerating this, which I'll kind of come on to in, in a minute. One of the big effects of vitamin C is in fact it dehydrates the cells. When vitamin C is pushed into a cell, it rehydrates. How your cells work is really with a lock and key mechanism. If you can imagine that a cell membrane, if it's all crumpled up and dehydrated, then it doesn't present the surface area to the nutrients and other and, and hormones and other chemical signals going around. So the, the lock and key mechanism of your normal body signaling doesn't work as efficiently as it does with vitamin C. Vitamin C increases the body signaling and absorption uh, uh, of these um, uh, hormones, etc. It boosts mitochondria, which we'll go on to in a minute. So mitochondria are the energy powerhouses of the cell. If you don't have enough mitochondria, you will not be able to function properly. You are the, uh, are fatigued, and I'll show you how it does that. And vitamin C will get through the blood-brain barrier actually to destroy these toxins within the brain, where DMPS, DMSA, and EDTA, in fact, cannot do that. Now, if I go back just to explain uh, this a little bit um, in the book, uh, how it said, how it works. Vitamin C is a reducing agent. It does not chelate minerals out. It can be used long term, other like other chelators, because these other chelators will take all the essential minerals that you need for functioning, your zincs, your coppers, your magnesiums out of the body too. EDTA is too weak to remove mercury. It hasn't got enough chemical energy to, to break the bond, even though they try to use it. Vitamin C works by donating an electron. This is what antioxidants do. It's the definition of an antioxidant. It donates electrons. Mercury, mainly from dentistry, when that's bound to tissues, when mercury is bound to tissues, it's forced to accept an electron from vitamin C. And when it does, it loosens the bond and becomes free. So imagine mercury atom hanging on by one hand like a monkey to a branch in a tree. Along comes vitamin C, gives the monkey a banana, in this case an electron. The monkey grabs the banana but falls out of the tree. Mercury in this state is not so reactive and will find it difficult to rebind into the tissues. Whilst it's in this state, glutathione wraps the mercury up and takes it out of the body in the colon. Now, this is where the really clever bit in and where we came to, glut to, to the glutathione. As glutathione does this, glutathione itself needs regenerating and to wrap up more mercury. To regenerate glutathione requires another electron from vitamin C. So if there is enough vitamin C available, glutathione keeps on regenerating, removing mercury and other toxins from the body, and a virtuous circle is created. This is why in our protocol, what we call the VTOX protocol, we added glutathione to the intravenous vitamin C infusion, this supercharged detoxification of mercury and other toxins of the body. This is one of the reasons why uh, vitamin C becomes, along with its ability to kill viruses and bacterials, a powerful weapon in the arsenal to stay healthy. Now then, how does it all work? Let's reiterate this. Unstable molecules that are missing an electron, they're called free radicals. Now, infections in the body produce these free radicals and a free radical, the whole, the only thing it wants to do is to stabilize itself and it will grab an electron from the nearest tissue it can. When it grabs that electron, it destabilizes itself, but destroys the tissue with which um, it has taken the electron from, and that tissue itself becomes 
another set of free radicals and you have a vicious cycle build up where one free radical produces more, which produces more, which produces more. Vitamin C, if there is high enough level in the body, acts as an antioxidant and this will donate the electron and we will neutralize the free radicals before they can cause the damage. White blood cells depend on vitamin C in order to survive and attack pathogens because they actually attack you by uh, uh, what we call per peroxidization, which I won't go into, but that requires vitamin C in it. And vitamin C plays an important role in antihistamine and reducing inflammatory response. Now then, come on girls, this is gonna keep your brain front. This is a mitochondria. Mitochondria are the energy source of the cells. Mitochondria, if we see here, and a little drawing up on the cell, you have the cell nucleus, and then there are little inclusions within the cells, mitochondria. The more mitochondria you have, and you can increase them, the better you function and feel. Vitamin C is not just is essential, absolutely vital for the proper functioning of mitochondria. All your mitochondria are inherited from your maternal DNA. The father contributes nothing, they're all maternal. They're very interesting creatures, uh, mitochondria. But how it works like this, if you imagine this ATP, ATP is the chemical, the energy that drives a cell, that drives a whole body. This is what the body is needs. So you have this ATP synthase. So this is a little factory in the mitochondria producing the ATP. And the factory, if you like, is represented by this wheel. Now this wheel works because the protons are produced by the complexes, these three areas here, and they come down and they turn the wheel. And as they turn the wheel ATP, so you have all these various enzymes reaction, which I won't go into. Now what the, what the thing about this is, these proton producers are very sensitive to pollutants. This one, for instance, cytooxidase is extremely sensitive to mercury. Mercury can knock this one out. This one is sensitive to fluoride. Fluoride can knock this one out. This one's like sensitive to different types of antibiotics. But what happens is with vitamin C and oxidative stress, vitamin C takes out the, uh, uh, the pollutant doing it. And by adding electrons to the system actually brings these systems back into operation. So they produce the protons, which produces, uh, which powers the pump, which produces the energy for the cells. So you're actually being poisoned by all these various things which slow down your mitochondria and vitamin C will penetrate the mitochondria and get things good. It will be able to short circuit the whole, uh, the whole business. Now, I still hope you got the brains in uh, going. I wouldn't normally show this, uh, but since I was told that my audience, they said was mainly uh, middle-aged housewives, I thought, well, they'd be a brighter lot than the average doctors and dentists. And I wouldn't normally go into this detail uh, as I say, doctors don't listen, and then dentists are too poisoned with mercury to take it all in anyway. But really, this is the virtuous circle. You have ascorbate, which you can cause as vitamin C, and it goes here, and it goes to dehydroascorbate. If you can add an electron, it goes back to ascorbate. So it goes round and round. And if you have here like glutathione here, or it can be reduced glutathione, glutathione itself picks up the uh, molecule, and then uh, say mercury, drops it in the cola and it becomes so what this GHG, it gets uh, some more, an electron from here and recycles itself. And in fact, the two, vitamin C could recycle glutathione and glutathione could recycle vitamin C. The two work hand in hand. So then let's go back to, to the chemistry uh, of it here. Let's look, look at here. Let's start at number one. If you have an enzyme with what's called an active group, an SH group, it becomes, the, this is reactive, uh, becomes reduced with an uh, oxygen reaction, oxygen species. And then you get the, the enzyme becomes inactive, and you get peroxide produced. And that peroxide is again a free radical because the oxygen is not stable. You then along comes uh, the stage two, you have the glutathione, meets the inactive enzyme, reactivates the enzyme itself, but then itself is, is reduced to JSSR. So now you have the enzyme, which unfortunately this time gets, hits mercury. So mercury then uh, attaches itself to the enzyme, the enzyme becomes inactive. Along comes vitamin C, adds an electron, adds an electron to it, 
the uh, the mercury and the enzyme, uh, the mercury is cut off. The mercury and the uh, glutathione combine together, so the mercury can no longer attach itself uh, to the tissues. The mercury is extruded, and the enzyme is once more active in the body. Here, the glutathione with the mercury either re is reactivated with more glutathione or vitamin C is enough, and then it comes down into the next one where you have the glutathione mercury uh, together and uh, a hydrogen there is produced, and that goes on to regenerate the vitamin C. So you have a virtuous cycle, one within the one, a virtuous circle. If there is enough vitamin C available, it constantly recycles glutathione. And re as I said, and glutathione recycles vitamin C. This is the way the body works. This is the way your body naturally, every day, 24 hours a day without rest, how it detoxifies everything that's put into it. You've heard, I suppose, of Herxheimer's reactions when you've had a, a, a die off of, uh, of bacteria and people become ill or when they're poisoned. And what it says is if you have killed bacteria, then the bacterial, the cells from the bacteria break down into little pieces, and that can cause an inflammation in the body and a, a massive uh, reaction, which is called the Herxheimer's reaction, where people feel sick, headache, et cetera, et cetera. And it's one of the commonest things with detoxification. You don't get it with enough vitamin C. Vitamin C will wipe out any of these toxins circulating in the body, and Herxheimer's reactions are gone. When we first started to want to use uh, glutathione, it was a very interesting story because uh, we hadn't got a clue how much you should use. So I rang uh, a friend of mine who's a, a physiologist in Sweden and I asked him, I said, I want to start injecting glutathione into people. And it had not been done. You couldn't get hold of glutathione. Uh, to do. You could only get a, um, an Italian uh, pharmaceutical company who sold 15 milligram vials of to be used in cosmetic procedures. Otherwise it was unobtainable. So I said, if I cut off somebody's arm, how much glutathione would I find in his arm? So he thought for a minute and he said, well, if it's a small arm, two to 400, uh, but an average arm, four to 800 milligrams. And so I thought, right, you're not really gonna harm people if you stick an armful in, are you? So this is why we call it the SBA, the standard British armful of glutathione. And that's what we started to give people, 400 milligrams up to 800 milligrams. And that's been now taken over. And this is what you get if you now go to a clinic and they give you glutathione, they will give you between four and 1200 milligrams, depending on the severity of the disease of, glutath of glutathione, along with the vitamin C. Glutathione, or you can call it GSH and vitamin C together, wipe out inflammatory cascades. So when you think of COVID, COVID kills people because it's a, it creates a cytokine storm. This is really is the free radicals produced by COVID destroy the lung tissue. The cytokine storm is what kills people. It's a storm. It's a free radical storm. If there are enough electrons there from glutathione and vitamin C, it will wipe it out and it will stop it and has been shown. So vitamin C, you can use it for cancer treatments. There are uh, clinics in the UK set up to use intravenous vitamin C for cancer. I'm really not gonna go uh, into that uh, too much at this point. It's been used for drug over overdoses. Uh, one of the things Dr. Klenner used to do, he used to do keep, and so what we did was keep seven and a half grams of vitamin C in a syringe because people could come into your surgery and you hadn't got a clue what's wrong with them. They could be unconscious sliding down the wall. You give them seven and a half grams and then they come out of it and they can tell you what's, what's happened and, and et cetera. And then you can create the right sort of treatment. It neutralizes toxins and is great for these modern chronic diseases. It is against, very effective against all infectious diseases if given in high enough doses for long enough. Those are the two things, high enough doses or long enough. It boosts the immune, think, immune system function, as we've said, and it kills organisms. It has an E number, it's E300. They use it as a food preservative by the ton in, in industry. You'll have a look, if you see E300, it means they have used vitamin C as a food preserver because it kills bacteria. It's extremely safe, it's very effective, it is inexpensive, and it is easy to administer. You can cure COVID this for under hundred pounds if you want. So when you compare that to what they're using now, the other drugs, et cetera, or in fact they're not doing now and ventilating people, which I think is criminal. Uh, when vitamin C used this way has in fact uh, been very successful against this, but for you could get rid of it for under hundred pounds. Most of the cases 
recover and most of these people can be treated at home without going into, into hospital. This is something that has been completely ignored by the medical establishment and completely ignored uh, by the government. At this point, I'll just say that when this whole thing started, I did get in touch uh, with the government and they have a therapeutics task force to, to look out for cues of this. They were told about this. I told them about this. I showed them the science. I even offered to, uh, to come and help them out because I have my own supply of vitamin C. Uh, which we keep in the fridge for our personal use. I said we, we would help and show people how to do it. They have shown little interest uh, whatsoever uh, all this time. Uh, if we're going to talk about uh, cancer just a little bit, IV vitamin C it acts as a pro-oxidant in that it forms a hydrogen peroxide, which acts as a chemotherapy agent, but a safe chemotherapy agent and destroys cancer cells. Liposomal C acts to prevent the oxidative stress, which alters the working of the cells together. This is why the two IV and liposomal should be used together. It acts to prevent chronic inflammation that allows mutant cells to develop fast. And there are clinics uh, that treat cancer both uh, uh, around the world. Uh, uh, you know, we, we work with one in, in, uh, in the UK. We ourselves were only dentists. We never, ever treated cancer. All we did was dental treatment. And uh, so cancer was not, was, was not our thing. But just we say it has been an effective cancer treatment used correctly. This is a little bottle. This is what intravenous vitamin C looks like. It's really sodium ascorbate. In each of these bottles is 25 grams of vitamin C. They're 50 ml bottles. And what you do, you dilute it in lactated ringer solution. There's a key here. The key is lactated ringer solution. If, for instance, you're using 25 grams in a sodium ascorbate, a sodium ascorbate, you put that in 200 mils of the ringer solution. It's diluted one to four. So if it comes out one to four, one vitamin C to four ringers, that's the mad number one to four. So 25 mil, put that in 200 mils, gives you 250 mils, and then that's in, put in intravenously. If you're using 50 grams, you're using 400 mils, and that will give you half a litre, 500 mils to in, inject into people. And the dosage is between 0.75 grams per kilo or one gram. It's easy to remember, one gram per body weight is what you need. So if you're treating a 70 kilo individual, you'll treat them with 70 grams of IVC. And you'll do that at 72 drops a minute. There is this clinic in Bedford, which is uh, uh, run uh, by a, series, a set of, of Asian doctors we know, and they're the only ones we know locally that will give vitamin C and uh, vitamin C infusions with, with glutathione. But this is, as I say, what the bottle looks like. And we put the back of the bottle just to show you, because everyone says, well, isn't it vitamin C too acidic? And we say, yes, vitamin C is too acidic in, but it's buffered. It's buffered with sodium ascorbate here and EDTA and the sodium hydroxide and adjusted with bicarbonate for a, a pH that is compatible with blood. So the key thing here is diluted in lactated ring is one to four, and then one gram per body weight, 72 drops uh, a minute. So just a few tips. When you're having an IVC, you'll always get 30, so you must have water on hand. Vitamin C sucks water out of the colon, hence the thirst. One of the constant complaints we got, the people said their eyesight's got better, they had to have new glasses after they went into a course of vitamin C because the prescription was now too strong. You cannot use glucose as a diluting agent. Glucose is similar to vitamin C. It looks very similar and it will, uh, when you inject uh, glucose into, into, into the body, it will compete with vitamin C and you will not get the effect of vitamin C. So you cannot use glucose. The common dilution agent used in commercial clinics is saline. We don't use, uh, we never used saline because we found that it can cause dizziness and slight disorientation during the IV because it upsets your electrolyte balance. Ring a solution is a mimic of your own blood. Uh, that way the electrolytes stay the same and you don't get any, any problems. Vitamin C used for a long time can and will reduce mineral levels. This is why you need to supplement with them both before and after taking it. Put IV in the glutathione. 
uh, put IV uh, glutathione in the solution. And also we use trace minerals, selenium, zinc, magnesium, B12, and the B vitamins. We used a minimum of three infusions once a day for three days. In very serious cases with people very ill, we would use two infusions, uh, morning and afternoon, and do that for up to sometimes five days. We never needed, no matter what the condition was, to go beyond five days. 72 drops a minute is the infusion rate. And you start off with seven and a half grams, it's called a fast push. You put in seven and a half grams very quickly over a couple of minutes. Uh, as I say, that can be used as first aid in emergency situations. That brings the blood levels up, then the intravenous slow drip keeps it up, and then liposomal C after that will keep the levels up very high. The higher levels of vitamin C you have, the quicker you'll get better. You cannot overdose using vitamin C. You cannot overdose. The more virulent the bug is, the more vitamin C you will need and for longer. And this is make them as a bit of a shock, but COVID-19 is not strong. The doctors in China are using 11 grams to get rid of COVID. Any bug that dies after 11 grams injected in is not very strong at all. So then why no glucose? This is due to the GAA, the glucose ascorbate uh, antagonism. I've already uh, gone over this. Elevated glucose levels compete with vitamin C, so you mustn't use it. And I say glucose has a, an affinity for insulin receptor. And with this insulin receptor means the higher the glucose with the insulin receptor being full, then less vitamin C will enter the cell. So sugar is also a pro-inflammatory as well as stopping the vit uh, vitamin C, will actually increase inflammation in your body. So please cut out all sugar. There are contraindications. The biggest one here is G, an enzyme called G6PD deficiency. This is a, an enzyme produced in the liver called G6PD. This is very, very rare. Patients with this can't eat certain types of beans and react to uh, certain types of antibiotics. So they almost always know before they come to see um, the practitioner that they have this, this deficiency. When you do have this and you give them vitamin C, the red blood cells form what's called rulo, which is, means they stick together in long chains. Uh, this can uh, cause uh, um, severe uh, health problems. You only mainly get it, you normally see it uh, as a genetic um, condition is seen in Eastern Mediterranean, some Orthodox Jewish communities, and in the East Africans. Uh, the lack of this enzyme gives greater protection against sleeping sickness or trypanomyosis. And so it's in, in East Africa, in order to, it's, it's become a protective mechanism. So people from there, you have to do a blood test first to find out if in fact they've got it. Now then, this is one answer to COVID. Let's talk about COVID now. AVC, IVC in different guises has been used by doctors in every continent. Many articles have been written about this, but they're ignored by the mainstream um, hospitals and governments out there. One of them is the MATHS protocol, which they use the steroids and minerals, but they only give six grams, and he has 98% effectiveness, he says, against all COVID patients, and he's only using six grams. This bug is not a strong bug. The Wuhan doctors gave 11 grams. Doctors in Pakistan are giving 50 grams routinely, also successfully against COVID. What this really means is while COVID is very contagious, it's easy to catch, but it's not generally fatal. COVID patients who became seriously ill, though, one common ground is, I know you've had a talk on vitamin D because vitamin D is also uh, extremely important. They all had extremely low levels of vitamin C and vitamin D. It's uh, wise to know at this point that the COVID virus has never, by, never ever been isolated. Uh, and I was checking up on this today and even now it hasn't been isolated. No one knows what it really looks like. What they're using to combat this is what a consensus of 30 virologists got together and believed it should look like, but no one's actually proven what it looks like or what it does. It has not been isolated. All of it, the treatment has been done basically on conjecture. The vulnerable groups to COVID are those in low in D, low in vitamin C, zinc and selenium. They're the nutritionally bankrupt. 
And in fact, that's most of the population, especially elderly population. Those with a reduced immu immune response, such as the elderly, those who are under heavy medication, or those who are under lifestyle or whatever it is, are high, uh, have a high level of oxidative stress uh, within the body. Because remember, as we said before, drugs, prescription and non-prescription drugs cause oxidative stress within the body and will reduce your immune response. Pre-existing conditions such as uh, diabetes and cancer, especially those who have conventional uh, treatments, those with uh, lung, liver and kidney disease, purely because they are oxidative stressors within the body and these conditions are caused by oxidative stressors in the body. So you have, again, a vicious circle, one cause causing the other. Even these vulnerable groups can protect themselves with high levels of vitamin C, cheaply and easily. So the daily dose. You can get tablets or powder or liquid forms. You can get synthetic or natural. The synthetic is not necessarily worse than the natural. They say the natural, it becomes with uh, bioflavonoids, et cetera, et cetera. But at the sort of doses you need to take it in, it really doesn't matter. You just need ascorbic acid in your bloodstream. And the best way to get this is high dose orally. If it's natural, okay, or not, but it really doesn't matter. The type of vitamin C used depends on your tolerance, how you, uh, you can tolerate it in the stomach, the cost of the various forms of it, and the availability to you. Most of this stuff is available on the internet. Because it goes out of the body frequently and it's uh, water soluble, you do best in two doses a day, I would suggest that depending on different lifestyles, you take between three and 10 grams a day minimum as a, pre a preventative. You take vitamin D between 3 and 1200 IU as a preventative. For vitamin D, if you have, say, say cancer conditions, you might need to go up to 25,000 um, IU or up to 30,000. The why vitamin D is used in cancer is that vitamin D causes um, lack of vitamin D, uh, allows the cells to be easily uh, parted. Uh, vitamin D lets the cells stick together. So if you have a cancerous tumor growing and it cannot separate the cells because there's a high amount of vitamin D there, then it stays in the one spot and allows your immune system to pick it out. That's why D, C, D is so good for cancer. With the symptom, if you have an increase in symptoms, they use a liposomal and one of the ascorbates, either vitamin C itself or magnesium ascorbate, use the two together orally. COVID-19, as I say, causes a cytokine cascade, which is uh, an inflammatory response due to free radicals. Vitamin C will stop this if given in high enough doses and for a long enough time over a few days. When it comes to vaccines, I was asked just to touch down, and I would talk very, very briefly on vaccines. Vitamin C may offer some protection against the side effects of vaccines. Uh, and there's no data available uh, of yet. Vitamin C has been used to protect children. Um, uh, uh, against vaccines, not time to go to that now. It does pre has prevented neurological um, damage, as I said, discuss. Okay, we'll discuss it a little bit. If when a child is going for a vaccine, you have a, a sample of urine and you, have the, you can buy these little strips and you dip the strip within the urine. If any vitamin C registers in the, trip, in the strip, it means they have vitamin C being excreted, they're okay. If they don't have it, they'll have very low vitamin C. They are more prone to neurological damage from the vaccine. This COVID vaccine is experimental. Nobody knows the long-term side effects at all of it yet. Completely unknown. They haven't, they haven't even completed the trials of it yet. It's the biggest experiment that's ever been done on human health in the world. Especially the mRNA vaccine, the Pfizer and Moderna, I would say these are especially uh, problematical. The instance, Pfizer has been banned in India because the Indian government wanted to do their own safety tests on it, and Pfizer refused to let their vaccine go through the test the Indian government wanted to do. I wouldn't have vaccines personally, but this is a per I'm not advising anyone to or against. I say I personally would have it as I don't think they've proven to be either safe or effective. And as I say, illness is something we don't get. Um, I don't see, uh, I haven't seen a doctor in, in years. This is not advice I'm giving to you. You should think what is right for you personally in your situation and do what is appropriate in your situation. Vitamin C produces oxygenation in the body. So if you have asthma, you'll actually find that asthma reproved even on, even on three grams a day can help asthmatics because it, it uh, reduces histamine and reduces the inflammation associated 
uh, with asthma. Again, in, di in diabetes, vitamin C actually stabilizes uh, blood sugar. Again, you have these advanced glycolic products, the AGEs produced, and uh, when that produces, um, vit uh, when vitamin C um, it drives down these AGEs and improves circulation and increases oxygen to the tissue. A sudden high dose of IVC can in fact cause a blood crash, blood sugar crash, and we did see this. When we gave IVC to someone who hadn't eaten or drunk anything prior to coming to, uh, to the clinic, then in fact their blood sugar would crash and they would um, uh, pass out and faint to us. And so we always had a glucose sachet on them, which we learned very quickly. They'd take that and that would neutralize it and stabilize the patient. But this was very rare and only happened to about one in a thousand patients who, who came through the door. You see, and so then the study, again, study vitamin C is linked to, vit heart disease is linked to vitamin C deficiency. Uh, but I guarantee if you go to any college in the country and say that, he'll laugh you out of the door. So just a quick recap, vitamin C is vital for life. It boosts the connective tissue, it's anti-inflammatory, it's antibacterial, it's antiviral, it increases the oxygenation of the tissue. It eliminates toxins from the body. It lets repair of the body go quicker. It's an increased rate of healing. It's available, it's affordable, it's effective, it's safe. It's been ignored for 70 years by the medical profession. It saved my life, but whether that's a good thing or not is open to, is open to debate in some quarters because as you've heard by now, I have not been uh, an uncontroversial character over these last 30 years um, in, in the medical uh, uh, circles or dental circles. There is a website called C4UK, Protect Our NHS with Vitamin C, where they have a petition going, which I would urge people to go, A, because to sign a petition to try to get the government to, to change. And also, there's a lot of useful uh, information there. You will find other doctors who've used it and vitamin C successfully against, against COVID. Uh, as you say, I spend my life, I'm a, I'm a fit, go, going around the world talking uh, uh, to, to various groups, but be they professional uh, groups or non-professional uh, groups such as yourselves, and we talk then, then to uh, a lot of politicians and civil servants. We give them talks on fluoride, because dentists can easily make you sick. Fluoride is a very potent toxin. And just as a, a word of advice, a small tube of fluoridated toothpaste contains enough fluoride to kill a six-year-old child. So a six-year-old child can and has in the past died through fluoride poisoning from ingesting one tube of fluoridated toothpaste. It's really toxic. We talk about amalgam and the mercury that comes off amalgam in the body, other dental metals. We talk about root canals, how their toxins can affect the body. We talk about cavitations or NECOs. These are neuralgia inducing cavitational osteitis, which are chronic infections in the bone, which can destroy your health. Uh, we talk about inclusion or TMJ, which is TMD for our American colleagues. And we also talk about how this can be found through things like thermography and ultrasound. These are all things we can talk about. If you want me to, at a later session, I'll be more than happy to. This is just to um, show you us. Uh, I'm the one on the, uh, on, on the right, as perhaps you've guessed. And on the left is my uh, uh, lovely wife there holding up the banner. This is on Trafalgar Square, where we have said uh, early on in this thing, stop testing the healthy replace your experts and IVC can cure COVID. We do this because we are very passionate about this because there are people dying who need not die. Businesses are destroyed, lives are destroyed, education is destroyed, and none of it, we believe, is necessary. So I'm looking forward, let's look forward to happier times. Here's me on my Harley David mo motorcycle. And so let's go ride everybody. And uh, I'm open to questions, and I hope you've enjoyed it. Thank you, Graham. There are quite a lot of questions. Um, first, I'm just going to encourage everybody to sign that um, petition because we're nearly with the 5,000 number. If we can get more people to sign the petition, that would be very helpful. Um, okay, so with the questions, we're going to take turns to ask questions. So a few people have asked about the vitamin C. Is it kind for the stomach? What type of um, vitamin C is good? The multivitamins or, um, you know, would you just take direct ones? Okay, um, good question. Uh, vitamin Graham. C. Uh, 
hello. Um, could I could I just ask you to switch up your PowerPoint, please? So it gives us more space for a wider screen. Okay. So switch off the PowerPoint. I think share screen. Don't share screen, I think. Maybe. Uh, I think I'm having the same issue. Are you? Okay. <laughs> I can't see any chat now. Stop share. Is that good? Ah, uh, that yeah. looks good. That, that's Great. better. That's, that's better. Good. Well done. Thank yeah, you. Man. Okay. Uh, ascorbic acid is an acid, and so it can it can cause uh, problems. It can cause uh, uh, stomach upsets. People can feel pain with it. It can cause uh, bloating. The this is why people sometimes use ester C, or the liposomal C. Um, or magnesium ascorbate. These are the general liposomal C, magnesium ascorbate or ester C. These can be used instead of the vitamin C uh, uh, powder, especially if you're going up, up into high dose of, um, uh, of uh, a bowel tolerance, which is a bit uncomfortable. To, to, to use as a multivitamin, the trouble is with multivitamins, they work out the RDA, so they're going to give you between 50 and 100 milligrams it's not enough, you need vitamin C in a gram form, not milligram form. So a multivitamin, while it's okay, it's good, it might give you enough trace elements and other things for vitamin C, I think you really need to take it uh, in high enough doses uh, by itself. Minu, do you want to ask the next question? Or? Yeah, there was one from uh, Dipti and Rumit. How does medicine for other conditions and vitamin C interact with each other? Oh, that's a good one. Diabetic medicines. Uh, that, uh, uh, that, that, that is a good one. Um, because uh, it, it, it makes things more effective, usually. Uh, vitamin C, because it will rehydrate the cells and create the uh, cells to be in the proper shape, it normally enhances the, um, uh, the effectiveness of, uh, of, of various... Um, of, of various medications. At the same time, uh, uh, vit vitamin C can in fact re also uh, reduce it. So you'll actually need to go to the individual, um, it should say on the individual drug sheet, uh, what it is. For instance, if you're going through chemotherapy, the doctors will advise you not to take vitamin C because vitamin C will destroy the chemotherapeutic agent. And uh, for some of the diabetic medicines, it, it's possible it could. I've never actually come across this. We used it a lot in diabetic patients without a problem. But I think you actually need to check the individual medicine there. Okay. And there was another one um, from Kerry. What strength is the best level to take? Well, it depends. If you just want to maintain a reasonably healthy uh, lifestyle and you're not under, you don't sm particularly smoke or drink under heavy stress, then probably three, three to five grams a day is, is ample. If you are under a, uh, a bit of stress, you may want, want, want to go uh, above that. But I would say for somebody in a normal, healthy, uh, healthy lifestyle, th uh, three, three to five grams uh, should be enough. Okay. You want okay. to come? Yeah, uh, Graham, uh, do you actually need a blood test to know that you're deficient in vitamin C? Uh, someone's uh, asked. Uh, a blood test? Not really, because vitamin C is water soluble. You can, um, any excess vitamin C have, will, will go out in, in the urine. So if you have, ex, you cannot have it too much of it because if you get too much of it, it's going to be excreted from the body and that will be measured in the urine with a, with a, with a simple dipstick. There's no blood test uh, you, you, can, you can do uh, for, for vitamin C now. Excellent, thank you very much. And there was also another question. Um, does it interfere with any minerals that you take? Should it be taken before or after any minerals? Uh, it doesn't interfere directly with the absorption. Uh, Long term, it can do. I mean, we've had cancer patients who, be, who gave themselves intravenous vitamin C for over 18 months on a daily basis, and uh, they reduced their mineral levels uh, quite a lot. But that was talking, you're talking 50 grams a day, every day for over 400 days. And on, under those circumstances, then uh, also the, uh, the patient was on a very restricted uh, diet that did uh, drop the levels. 
So it's really not a concern. Uh, for general, if you do an IV over a long time, uh, yes, mm -hmm. it, it should be monitored, but most people aren't. Thank you. Um, Kate works in a pharmacy and she's asking um, how she can relay this information best in the pharmaceutical setting. Mm. I think it, it's if you go on the uh, the sites uh, that we noticed um, before, you'll find a lot of them will actually have like a patient leaflet to, to, to print out, which will give you the details. And that might be enough um, to uh, uh, just to hand just, just to hand to patients. Okay. Um, My next. Yep. Uh, okay, I think as uh, so quite a few of them have said that. Can you share the name of your book, please? But um, the second, um, the next question was what, toxic dentistry exposed. I hope you can read backwards. Is, yeah. <laughs> what vitamin C do you take, Graham? That was from. Uh, Kerry, powder or tablet form? Uh, I, I, I use both. I, I use a tablet. Uh, I, I use a tablet form in, in the morning. It was called the sustained release one, which is uh, go out over the first few hours. And in the afternoon, I, I top that up with um, uh, five grams of uh, uh, in, in a powder form. I'm completely tolerant to it. It doesn't bother. It doesn't bother me. Lillian doesn't like it in ascorbic acid, so she uses uh, ecstasy uh, in this form. But I, I just use the ascorbic acid, and I get this. The ascorbic acid is either from uh, a company we said before, that Vital Organico, which is in Ireland, or uh, if it's the, in the UK, I also get it from Health Leads because I know they're an ethical company and they use clean sources. Okay, next one. Is it okay to take vitamin C tablets at the same time as vitamin D, or should they be taken at separate times? That's by him. No, it can be taken at the same time. Vitamin C is water soluble, and vitamin D is an is an oil soluble, so they have different absorption pathways in the body. No, you're, you're perfectly fine taking them together. I take mine together anyway. Okay, over to you, Gita. Um. Yes. Graham, um, does it interfere with hypothyroidism? Is it good for hypothyroidism? Oh, that's a very interesting question, that one. Um, there's so much hypothyroidism about these days um, compared to, to when I was a youth many years ago. Uh, a, a, a lot of reasons, I, I think, for, for this, especially, especially we used to see it in, um, in, in females. Females seem to suffer from it uh, a, a lot more the males, we have a theory about this, but no, it, it doesn't affect it. Um, uh, we would actually recommend um, do you take it in, in hypothyroid uh, conditions because the thing about hypothyroidism, it, it's you have a whole feedback mechanism with the, uh, uh, with the immune system. And so you, if that gets out of kilter at all, then you can get into an oxidative stress syndrome. And so no, we would recommend, we would recommend it to it uh, that you do have it. And we have a lot of patients over the years with, with hypothyroid issue. It will not cure hypothyroidism. If you have a, a, a malfunctioning, uh, uh, it, it will not cure it. One of the problems was that mercury is, is attached to the thyroid. And so mercury, which you get from dental fluid, will attach to the thyroid and reduce its function, which is um, uh, w one of the reasons uh, we got onto it. And in order to get rid of that, then you need a high amount of selenium too, because in the thyroid, if your selenium is high enough, then the thyroid will absorb selenium rather than the mercury, any mercury it's going about. And okay. so you will get a, 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 better, a better thyroid function. But no, it will not affect any um, thyroid medications, etc. Excellent. Thank you very much. Can too much vitamin C cause kidney stones? Ah. And, and is, is amla powder the best source of vitamin C? That's a really good question. I'm so glad someone answered that. That's a, uh, that's a real fallacy that has come out over the years, that, that, that vitamin C uh, causes what's called an oxalate reaction, in, and, and this oxalate causes oxalate stones in. That's a theoretical uh, reaction. When we first started using vitamin C all in the 90s, we didn't know this, and we, we, we read about this, that, that it could do. So one of the things we would do from patients is, if they had any kidney condition, we wouldn't treat them. Now, the patients, being a smart lot, soon, soon got the idea about this. So they would lie to us, and if they had kidney conditions, 
wouldn't say. So we treated them. And eventually, one day we got a letter, which I've still got from a kidney specialist saying, I don't know what you're doing, uh, but my patient who had a long-term chronic kidney problem now doesn't have it anymore. <laughs> and that's when we thought, ah, oh, well, this whole kidney stone basis, and it's more theory than practice. No, we never saw it in practice. No, you don't get kidney stones uh, from vitamin C. Hey. Um, ben, do you want to say any more questions? I haven't looked at the uh, questions myself. I've left it to you ladies. Okay, no worries, okay. Um, I've got one. Um, is it okay to take vitamin C, 1,000 milligrams, for ovari ov ovarian, sorry, I can't say that word. Ovarian, so, yeah. Yeah, ovarian cyst and uh, fallopian tube infections? That's a bad well, any sort of infection is probably you, 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 you're you going to need more than just a gram, I think. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and and those things, because again, it's just, uh, this is not um, personal ad advice I'm giving. All I could say was um, for these sort of conditions, you may want to, 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 to try even go up to sort of bowel tolerance for a bit and, and see and see what and see what happened there. It certainly shouldn't do any harm to it. But I don't think one gram a day is going to do much to it. So can taking vitamin C cause any side effects? Example, rickets? That's the next question. I don't know. Rickets really is, um, uh, that, that's vitamin D formation. So uh, no, it, 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 doesn't, uh, it, it, it doesn't really do uh, much for, uh, for things like, like, like rickets. Smith is asking if the um, glutathionum, um, glutathionum, I can't say the word. <laughs> sorry. But, yeah. Can you, you know, do you need to take it, and how, what dose? Do you need to take it daily? I would suggest not. You, we would only take it if we were, thought we were under special a form of oxidative stress. I, if, if one of us got an infection or had been exposed to, to a toxin or was under a lot of stress. Uh, then, then uh, we we would take it before glutathione. Before liposomal glutathione was available, you could buy glutathione tablets, but they weren't very well absorbed in the gut. Glutathione is three amino acids uh, together, and they're broken down in the gut and then reformed, and they weren't very efficient. And so we used to use what we call NAC. That's N acetylcysteine, which is a precursor to glutathione, that would boost that boosts your glutathione levels. So you can get that. But if you are um, suffering from illness or under oxidative stress, then yes, we would take glutathione. And the optimum way of taking that is the liposomal one um, from uh, Vital Organica. Is a good source amla powder? Some people have mentioned about amla powder. Don't know that one. Haven't heard okay, of that. Okay, no worries. Or Baroka, Baroka mm -hmm. on a daily basis. I've seen that in the uh, chemists, uh, but I don't know how much it contains. You just have to read the, the thing. How much does it actually contain? What doses are you allowed to take, Graham? Uh, if it's um, it, individual tolerance, again, if you're perfectly well, then you shouldn't really have a problem between uh, three, three and, and ten grams a day. If you're ill, then you you'll be able to take a lot more before you run into what's called bowel tolerance. This is when the bowels become loosened up, a diarrhea effect. Um, but you have to be quite uh, ill for that. I say when 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 I had my problem uh, with the python. Uh, I got up to 120 grams in a day, where I can take 30 grams a day normally without, without any effect. It'll vary uh, per person to person. Uh, Some, somebody which... said that um, um, amla powder is gooseberry powder. Yeah. Amla powder is gooseberry powder. Yeah. Yeah. And um, Graham, somebody asked if it's possible to take vitamin C naturally without taking tablets and they get the same amount. Naturally. Well, well, in theory, they say this uh, through food, but as we mentioned earlier, the foods just don't contain enough. So I, I would say gen generally not. And also the styles of, of life that, that we've got now, the, the pollutions are under. We go out, we breathe in exhaust fumes. Uh, you know, we brush our teeth with these uh, with toxic toothpaste. We breathe in all these, um, uh, uh, the aerosols, even from washing powder, makeup and hair dye, all these are oxidative stressors. And so you just will not get it. Uh, no, I'm, I'm sorry that uh, I just do not think 
you're going to get enough with our sort of 20th century lifestyle now, which we are living in a very toxic and polluted world. And the food that we get is also uh, full of toxins and, and pollutants and, and, and weed killers. And every time you ingest uh, food, you'll get weed, uh, say, a, a, a batch of weed killer or, or especially say Roundup or, or, or whatever in it. Well, Roundup is extremely toxic and, what you, and the liver's gonna have to do that. How's it gonna detox it? It needs vitamin C. I'm sorry, you won't get away. The from more it. toxins you have, the more vitamin C you should take. Right? Oh, absolutely. The more poisoned you are, the more you need it. Yeah, they're saying that um, there's a di there's somebody's asked a question about being a diabetic and if they have vitamin C and D, if they have 4,000 IUs of, C of D, would you also have um, a similar sort of amount of vitamin C? Uh, well, well I, I would say if you you know, no one, no one, I don't think anyone's going to come any harm on four grams of vitamin C a day. You said um, a gram per your kilograms, is it? That was intravenously. That oh, intravenously. Interven right, that, was an okay. that was intravenous, an intravenous dose okay. that, that, that you would give them. Okay. Okay. I think that's it. Yeah. Thank you very much. I think yeah. we've answered all majority of the questions. Um, if we have left out, then uh, we will put it down in our group. I'll uh, send off the all the questions to Dr. Graham as well, to, for him to put it down for us in email. Yeah. Well, well, one word here, I've just seen that Dr. Elmer Young has, uh, has, has joined us. Uh, you know, hi, Elmer. Uh, I'm retired as a dentist, but Elmer Young, uh, whom I know uh, very, very well together, is very experienced in intravenous vitamin C and, and, and dental problems. And so he's the really, for, for people with, um, or suspect or want to find out if dentistry is affecting their health. He's the, he's the man to go to. He, he's a, Dr. Elmer Young, who's a dentist in, in Southampton. Hi, Elmer. Good to see you here. Does he want to say a few words? You're muted, Elmer, if you want to talk. Can you show? Hello. Can't hear you. No, I, th I think you're still muted. Yeah, you're still muted. I think um, Panabhan has to unmute him. Um, but whilst, whilst he's been uh, unmuted, you, you, don't need, you don't need to hear him talk anyway. Somebody was asking about when Mercury was banned, Graham? Uh, yeah, Mercury got banned for women and children in uh, July uh, 2018 because we put pressure on the EU for, for, uh, for many years. And uh, we've, we've got it, uh, we fought against the dental associations. And uh, we managed in the World Dental Federation and the EU finally banned it for women and children at, at that particular point, no more mercury fillings. And now we're working to get a ban, a complete ban in the EU. We're hoping by 2025, but it may go to 2027. And we hope to have actually a worldwide ban in place by 2030. But we're, okay. we're, still, working, we're still working on that. Yeah. Excellent, thank you. Dr. Elma is unmuted now. Yeah, hi Graham. Fantastic <laughs> talk. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. Hello. Thanks for joining us. You're on it. You're very welcome. It was a pleasure to be here. Yeah, it's really, yeah, it's good. Anjali says that you're an um, excellent dentist. He says a few words. <laughs> well, Gray must know. We worked together for many, many years. So. Nine years. Nine years we worked together for nine years. That's great. Um, you know, I go to him for treatment. Well, it's brilliant what you've done about the mercury-free, you know, a lot of comments. Excellent. There's been some great comments about, you know, everyone's um, very thankful for your, for your talk and saying it's amazing. You know, what you've, the information you've given out, some people might find it too scientific, but a lot of people are saying it's, um, you know, very informative. So they find it very helpful. Thank you. And you can always listen to my podcast. There's also a lot of information about mercury and all the nasty materials and treatments what we can do in dentistry and how we can prevent that. And yeah. what about if you have mercury feelings, what steps can you take to remove them? Uh, well, uh, the, the, it becomes, a, there are certain protocols uh, to, to remove. When you remove a mercury filling, you will expose yourself and the dentist and the lady who's a dental assistant to high levels of mercury vapor in the air. And so there are certain protocols to take to reduce that which is why dentists like me and dentists like Elmer use these protocols so you're not being exposed to mercury when, when you're taking them out. Uh, we wouldn't say to take them out um, just for the sake of 
taking them out because of, because of mercury. You need to think very, very carefully and really go to someone who's experienced in taking them out properly. Otherwise, you'll end up with um, giving yourself uh, quite a dose of mercury. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, Panaben, do you want to close off? Yes, um, I'm going to say thank you very much for everyone to join in. We have another beautiful session on Thursday. It's all about uh, finance and your tax return and how to keep your money safe. So why don't you all join us again on Thursday? Um, I think it's half past eight. So it will give you time to relax and join in. So yes, if you can try and join in a little bit earlier so that uh, we're not spending time um, adding everybody while the talk is going on. That's a good so point. <laughs> Because we miss the lecture of ourselves. Yeah, because we're trying to listen as well. Okay, thank you very much again for everyone to join us in. A special thank you to the ladies who helped us with the uh, questions. And Dr. Graham and your partner, thank you once again for explaining everything what vitamin C is and mercury. We really appreciate oh, it. We'll so soon have you. It's, it's a pleasure and okay. thank you for the invitation. Yeah, and thank you, Dr. Elmer, for joining us as well. Thank you. Very welcome. Thank you, everyone. It was wonderful. It was very important. Thank you. Okay, thank bye. you. Thank you, everybody. Bye -bye. Thank you, ladies. Bye. Thank you, everybody. See you on Thursday. Yeah.